Hello, this is Margaret Moore. Forum tonight features part of the 1982 Charles Strong Memorial Lecture presented at the Australian Association for the Study of Religions Conference in Melbourne. The speaker is Professor Anthony Johns, Professor in the Faculty of Asian Studies at the Australian National University, who talks on Moses in the Koran. Miriam the prophetess, heir and sister, took up a timbrel, and all the women followed her with timbrels dancing. And Miriam led them in the refrain, Sing of the Lord, he has covered himself with glory. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. This song of Moses celebrates one of the great scenes in world religious literature. The escape of the Israelites from Egypt and the drowning of Pharaoh and the Egyptians who were pursuing them in the sea. It is a central point in the career of Moses, flanked on one hand by his encounter with the burning bush, on the other by given the law on Mount Sinai. This scene has a crucial role in salvation history as perceived in the traditions of Judaism, Christianity and Islam. For Judaism, the Passover, the prelude to the escape from Egypt when the Egyptians were slain is the first month of the year to be celebrated for every year in all time to come. For Christians, the crossing of the Red Sea is a model of the passage from death to life, signifying dying to sin and rising to grace, a very image of the resurrection of Christ. And for Muslims, it is the proof of God's power in overwhelming those who reject his messengers, in raising up the great lawgiver and ruler of his people, Moses, to whom he spoke establishing a covenant that was to endure until the final revelation made to Muhammad. Each tradition has developed and elaborated its vision of Moses in line with his own pattern of development. In particular, the Hellenizing Jewish communities of Alexandria added their own dimension to him. And in the Muslim tradition, he became a model of sanctity, privileged above all others, apart from Muhammad, by God speaking to him. He is an example of heroic holiness that has reached the threshold of God himself. It is right to be skeptical of word or verse, frequency counts, to decide the relative emphases given to particular individuals in particular texts. But the fact that in the Quran there are about 93 verses relating to Jesus, 131 to Noah, 235 to Abraham, and by comparison, an overwhelming 502 to Moses, gives us an approximate idea of how central the role of Moses is in the tradition of a line of prophets that for Muslims was to find its apogee in the vacation of Muhammad, and how Moses was the figure that the Quran presented to Muhammad above all others as a supreme model, as a savior and ruler of a community and a man chosen to, represent, to present both knowledge of one God and the divinely revealed system of laws, of which in the Judaic and Christian tradition, the Ten Commandments is the basic charter. The paradox is that were it not for the early books of the Bible, we would know relatively nothing close in time of that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed how in the beginning heaven and earth rose out of chaos. The figure of Moses in the Quran, and hence his importance in the Muslim tradition, is not accessible to a superficial reader of the Quran. This is in part because of the nature of the Quran, and in part because non-Muslims looking at Islam from the outside have often not realized that the predecessors of Muhammad in the prophetic tradition of the Quran have a continuing role to play. That their call and their challenges were experienced by him. And that their roles were not only known by the Muslim community, but experienced by them through their presentation in the Quran, through the narratives that the Quran provides. Indeed, such events in the accounts of the prophets in the Islamic dispensation are presented in the Quran with such immediacy and power that they create in the imagination a desire to set them in a broader framework. A framework which, even if it passes beyond the information given by the Quran or beyond the facts, 
that can be given a time and place by historians present a human dimension to these culture heroes and have generated an important literary genre. Of these, the most famous is the figure of Joseph. His relations with Zuleika have been used in moral, romantic, and mystical senses. His magnanimity to his brothers is presented as a model for Muhammad to those who reject him. And the grief of his father Jacob for the loss of his son is a solace for all who grieve. Never let it be forgotten that the figures of his predecessors presented in the Quran were real people to Muhammad, and that in sayings attributed to him, he spoke of them as his brothers, whose actions and whose judgments he revered and imitated. It is difficult to find the right words to describe how the Quran should be experienced if we are to see it as it sees itself. It is full of echoes and resonances which react, reflect, and reinforce one another. Thus, to see the book as it presents itself, the usual quick method of the Westerner, a selective quotation of verses, words, and names picked out through going through a concordance without realizing the whole understanding the hold in which these individual references are set is not sufficient. The Quran then has to be taken on its own terms. References to Moses occur throughout the Quran. And if one regards the chronology of revelation as proposed by such scholars as Nerdica, Bell and Blasher as a rough guide, one can see references to Moses and his authority from the very earliest chapters of the book, increasing in frequency and detail towards the end of the Meccan period. That is to say, before the migration to Medina in 622, culminating with the first great encounter with the burning bush and the commission to warn Pharaoh to let the Israelites go, and with the second great encounter on Mount Sinai. And then finally, in the period at Medina, we see Moses' experience with his recalcitrant followers as a model for Muhammad's own debates with the Jews who refused to accept his message, his role, his authority. I begin with chapter 20 of the Quran, which is called Taha, which begins, or is the part relating to Moses begins, have you heard the story of Moses, of when he saw a fire and said to his family, Stay here. Indeed, I see a fire. Perhaps I can get a brand from it, or by the light of this fire, find guidance. When he approached it, a voice called Moses, I, indeed I, am your Lord. So take off your two sandals. You are in the sacred valley of Sinai. I have chosen you. So listen to what is to be revealed to you. I, truly I, am God. There is no God but I. So worship me and perform the prayer so that you will remember me. The hour is coming. It will soon be revealed when every soul will be recompensed for what it has done. Do not let yourself be turned back by those who do not believe it and follow their passions and do wrong. This surah also gives a fuller account of the third occasion on which God has shown his kindness to Moses. Again, and this is characteristic of the Quran, there is a rapid shift of scene. Moses is a young adult. He comes into the city when it is deserted and finds two men fighting. One of his own people an Israelite, and the other, an Egyptian. The Israelite asks for help. Moses, by tradition, a strong and swarthy man, responds, strikes the Egyptian, and kills him. He is overwhelmed by shock and grief at what he has done, and prays for pardon, for he knows that God is the pardoner, the merciful. Moses flees and prays for God to guide him. He finds his way to Midian and comes to a spring 
where men are watering their flocks. Standing at one side are two women who are reticently waiting until the men have finished. He waters their flock for them, then withdraws to the shadow and says in prayer, my Lord, I stand deeply in need of all the good you can give me. One of the two women then approaches him modestly and says, my father invites you to his home to reward you for watering our sheep for us. Moses returns to the house. One of the daughters suggests to her father, Shoaib, the counterpart of Jethro in Genesis, that he employ him. He does so and marries him to one of them with, as a bride price, a pledge to work for him for eight or ten years. When the term is complete, Moses leaves with his wife to return to his homeland, Egypt. It is on this journey that he encounters the burning bush. And the account in this chapter, that is to say 28, in part mirrors, in part creates new perspectives to the account given in chapter 20. For our purposes, there is no need here to go into details of Moses' confrontation with Pharaoh. The flight from Egypt takes place after floods, locusts, lice, frogs, and blood have afflicted the country. In chapter 7, the sequence of events is swiftly told. A dramatic and moving episode is given in chapter 10, called Jonah, Eunice. Chapter 10, verse 90. We parted the sea for the Israelites, then Pharaoh and his army followed them, filled with greed and enmity. Yet when drowning overwhelmed them, Pharaoh said, I believe there is no God but the God in whom the Israelites believe. I am among those who submit myself to him. This conversion of Pharaoh is a striking feature of the chapter, which has provided a debating point for theologians and mystics for centuries. Was Pharaoh's repentance accepted or not? The crossing of the sea leads to the scene on Mount Sinai. We commanded Moses to fast for 30 nights, to which we added another 10. Then, after these 40 nights, the time his Lord had appointed came. And Moses said to his brother Aaron, take charge of the people in my place. Act well, and do not follow the way of those who do evil upon the earth. There's a swift change of scene again in which Moses is on the mountain. And the Quran says, when Moses came to the point in time we had decreed and his Lord spoke to him, he said, my Lord, let me see you. He replied, you shall not see me, but look at the mountain. If it stands firm in its place, then you shall see me. And his Lord revealed himself to the mountain and it shattered to dust. Moses collapsed as one struck by lightning. When he recovered, he said, praise be to you. I turn to you. I am the first of those who believe in you or who believe that you cannot be seen in this world by human eyes. God said to him, Moses, I have chosen you out of all mankind for my message and for my words. So take what I have given you and be thankful. These scenes are communicated in the Quran with tremendous power through the extraordinary rhetorical instrument that is Arabic. In a very important sense, these observe observations only touch the surface of the Quran, which contains the promises of a profound spiritual life. For those of us brought up in the Hellenic tradition, there is a tendency to look in a text even a sacred text for, to use Fritz Joff Schwann's words, a meaning that is fully expressed and immediately intelligible. In the Islamic tradition, on the other hand, there is often a very highly developed love of verbal symbolism and a capacity to read in depth. The revealed phrase is, 
an array of symbols from which more and more flashes of light shoot forth the further the reader penetrates into the spiritual geometry of the words. Words are reference points for a doctrine that is inexhaustible. Schoen also speaks of the role of commentaries springing from the oral tradition which accompany revelation from its beginning, interrelating missing though implicit parts of the text, specifying in what relationship or in what sense a given thing should be understood, and explaining the diverse symbolisms often simultaneous or superimposed one on another. In short, they form part of the tradition. They are of, of the sap of its continuity, even if they are committal to writing, or in certain cases their re-manifestation occurred only at a relatively late date in order to meet the requirements of a particular historical period. The commentaries, in fact, provide the link between the revealed word and the understanding of the word in the community, which indeed is a crucial part of its meaning. The great 13th century um, commentator Fakhruddin Arazi summarizes much useful information relevant to our understanding of the way the commentators work and repeats much of what was presented by his predecessors. He explains, for example, why the story told of Moses in chapter 20 was communicated to Muhammad. It was to strengthen Muhammad's heart in face of difficulties. And it was to strengthen him by telling him of the difficulties faced by prophets before him. And he began with Moses because the tests and the trials Moses endured were very great. In order to comfort him and to strengthen him in the hardships he had to bear. At once we see a major function of this reference to early prophets and with it an aspect of Muhammad's personality overlooked in the more triumphalist accounts of his life and certainly missed by the majority of non-Muslim authors, that he was a man who suffered in the course of his vocation and who needed the strength and the consolation that the Quran provided for him. The Quran itself gives a mysterious and profound account of Moses' encounter with a mysterious figure, a prophet a saint called al -Khidr. At a superficial level, it might be considered simply as a midrashic type of episode to show how God's knowledge is greater than that of men. But it exercises an incredible power of attraction. And generation after generation of exegetes have shown how deeply it is integrated in the texture of the Quran and discovered level upon level of meaning in it. Moses is told to set out on a journey and he says to his servant I will not rest until I reach the meeting point of the two seas even if I should journey for many years and the two of them set out then the two of them met one of our servants I quote from the Quran chapter 18 Moses said to him may I follow you so that you can teach me a right understanding of what you have been taught. He replied, you will not be able to bear with me patiently. How can you bear patiently with what you do not fully understand? Moses said, if God so wills, you will find me patient and I will not disobey you in anything. The figure, al Kidr replies, then if you follow me, do not ask me about anything I do before I explain it to you. So they set out. But when they were on board a ship, he made a hole in it. And Moses said, did you make a hole in it to drown those on board? You have done a terrible thing. al Kidr replied, did I not say that you would be unable to bear with me patiently? Moses said, do not punish me on account of my forgetting. Do not impose on me something too difficult for me to bear. Then they set out again and met a young man and Kidra killed him. Moses said, have you killed an innocent 
without even the excuse of blood retaliation? You have done an evil thing. He replied, did I not say to you that you would not be able to bear with me patiently? Moses said, if I question you about anything after this, be my companion no longer. I ask your pardon. Then the two of them set out again until they came to the people of a village and asked them for food. But they refused to welcome them as guests. Then they saw in the village a wall on the point of collapse and al Kidra shores it up. Moses said, if you had wished, you could have earned a wage for that. And the figure al Khidr says, this is the parting of the ways between you and me. Now I will tell you the meaning of what you could not bear with patiently. As for the ship, it belonged to some poor men who worked at sea, and I wished to damage it, so that it would be of no value to the tyrannous king who was seizing every ship by force. As for the youth, his parents were devout believers, and we feared that he would burden them with arrogance and unbelief. And we prayed that their Lord would give them, in place of them, of him, one better than he, more virtuous and faithful. And as for the wall, it belonged to two orphan boys in the village. Beneath it was a treasure chest belonging to them both. Their father was a righteous man, so your Lord desired that they should come of age and discover their treasure as a blessing from your Lord. What I did, I did not on my own account. This is the meaning of what you could not bear with patiently. In this scene, there is a remarkable picture of Moses, not as a teacher, but humbly attaching himself to a teacher, being given three tests which he fails. And it is in the kind of shock, the perplexity, which comes to Moses when he realizes he fails this test, that his vision is opened out into a more universal understanding of the mysteries of God's plan. This survey of Moses, however, while giving some idea of the importance of Moses in the Muslim tradition and the richness of the diverse ways in which he was understood and in which he inspired the religious imagination. If this, in its fullness, is added to the traditions he has inspired in Judaism and in Latin and Greek Christianity, whether in story, prayer, hymn of praise, or iconography, the corpus of material is staggering. What a commentary on the history of these three traditions that in sharing such veneration for this chosen shepherd, they have found so much to quarrel about with such disastrous results. Professor Anthony Johns, Professor in the Faculty of Asian Studies at ANU.